Hello, everyone. This is Robert Nicholson, president of the Philos Project. Very grateful that you joined us here in the middle of your Friday. We have uh, a lot to talk about and a uh, very short time in which to talk about it. So I'm going to, uh, to get right to it. We're here to talk today about a conflict and a conflict that we believe at the Philos Project is a very, uh, very important conflict although one that is uh, very little known, especially here in the US. This conflict, uh, which is a clash between Armenia or Armenians and the nearby country of Azerbaijan with the involvement of the country of Turkey is important to us, not only because Armenia is a Christian country and the ancient homeland of the Armenian people, but also because uh, due to the involvement of other powers like Turkey, like Russia, like Iran, uh, this conflict has the potential of sending a, a ripple effect around not only the region, but, but also around the world. So it's important for us to know about this conflict, to talk about it and to uh, disentangle it. We have three experts uh, here on the call today. The problem that we find with this conflict is that People don't know the words, right? People uh, at this point in the US know Lebanon, they've heard of Iraq, they know Afghanistan, but Armenia, Azerbaijan, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, it sounds like uh, an alien language, which indeed it is in some sense. And so to try to unpack that today, we have uh, our three guests. And I'd like to read their, their bios. Before, we, before I do, I'd like to thank uh, Juliana Tamarazi and the Iraqi Christian uh, Relief Council for co-sponsoring this briefing today. We're very grateful for their partnership on, on this as well as so many other things. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Mark Movsesian first. He is the Frederick A. Whitney Professor of Contract Law and the Director of the Center for Law and Religion at St. John's. He's also been a visiting professor at Notre Dame and Cardozo Law School. He himself graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College, magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was the editor of the Harvard Law Review, very prestigious uh, spot, uh, and a recipient of the Sears Prize, uh, as well as later clerking for Supreme Court Justice David Souter and uh, serving as attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel at the US Department of Justice. Very grateful to have Professor Mosesian with us. Also would like to introduce Armin Sahakian, uh, a friend, also the executive director of the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region based in Southern California. Uh, he, Armin, oversees grassroots community development, public policy advocacy, coalition building, media relations. Uh, he also, I think, washes the dishes at the uh, Anka headquarters uh, <laughs> and pretty much everything else. He holds a Master of Arts degree in International Relations and International Economics from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Inter Advanced International Studies and a Bachelor of Arts in International Political Economy from Bloomfield. Last but not least is Philos Project Research Fellow Von Der I knew I was going to butcher that. Uh, Der Megerdichen. Uh, he's a graduate of UCLA where he majored in history, minored in Armenian studies. Uh, where he was granted honors in history for his thesis on the competing nationalisms of, and the overlapping conflict of interest between Armenians and Kurds over a common homeland. He's interned at the Republic of Armenia's Ministry of Economy and United Nations Secretariat in Yerevan, where he worked at the UNHCR and UNDP agencies. Currently, uh, uh, Vaughn is studying at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, where he is focusing on international finance and economic development. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Very grateful to have you. Thanks so, for having us. Thank you. I would like to, uh, to get in right into the substance and I'm gonna put aside for me what is the most burning question, which is why all Armenian names uh, end in Yan, but we're gonna, maybe we'll get to that at the end. Uh, it's not the topic for today. Uh, I'd like to go uh, right to you, Vaughn, and ask you to tell us in brief what the heck has happened over the past couple of weeks in the South Caucasus and whether this clash, this most recent clash, is different, and if so, how, from uh, previous clashes between these two countries. Sure. Uh, firstly, thanks for having us on. Uh, 
I think we can look at this event in isolation. I think uh, the dust still hasn't settled from the 1994 ceasefire. Um, from 1988 to 1994, there was the Artsakh Liberation Movement, Artsakh being the historical name for nagorno karabakh um, So we've seen recent flare-ups. Uh, we saw one in 2016. There was a four-day war, a brutal, brutal war. Um, with heavy casualties on both sides. Um, more recently, we saw skirmishes in July um, that lasted about two weeks. And um, just a few weeks ago, I believe we're on our 13th day, uh, Azerbaijan began to shell the capital city of Artsakh, um, Stepanagert, um, targeting civilian settlements. And, and you asked a great question as to, is this different? Is this something, um, have we seen this before? Uh, well, this is the first time that the capital city of Stepanakert has been shelled since the 90s, the, the war in the late 80s and the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, it's been a lot of kind of sniper fire. Uh, you know, there's, it's, it's been mostly uh, gunfire exchanges along the line of contact, but uh, we're seeing artillery being shelled into not only Artsakh, but into Armenia proper as well. Uh, you know, Turkish drones have been uh, have been fired down on uh, the area of Vartanis, which is in Armenia proper uh, in the eastern region of Gegarkunik. Um, so this, the magnitude, the sheer magnitude of what's going on is, is, is far greater than anything we've seen since, um, I guess, the, the war that culminated in the, the Bishkek Protocol and the ceasefire in 1994. Um, essentially what's happening is, is Azerbaijan trying to, trying to invade into um, trying to infringe, I guess, upon the sovereignty of the Armenian Republic of Artsakh, and the situation's fluid. Positions are being taken. Positions are being um, lost as well. And um, what we're seeing is, yeah, civilian civilian settlements being targeted. We're seeing international journalists, uh, holy sites, churches, cathedrals being pillaged. And um, I think it's important to also note that uh, it also can be seen. This event that's transpiring can't be seen in isolation. There's a lot, there's a lot of going on. Um, there's a lot of ethnic cleansing at heart, I believe that's the, that's the essential purpose of, of this. It seems as if, you know, Azerbaijan kind of wants Armenia without its Armenians. Uh, but that's, I guess, for another question. And I guess just another good rule of thumb as to why this is happening is, is anytime these flare ups happen, we can kind of look internally into Azerbaijan and see, are there, domestic problems? Is there economic turmoil? Recently, uh, you know, there's been banking crises in Azerbaijan. We're seeing the Turkish lira hit an all-time low, approaching eight liras to the dollar. Um, that's why the, one of the reasons we're seeing Turkey being uh, behind these arming Azerbaijan. And I guess um, regarding some of the statistics of, of what's going on, um, there's been different numbers being reported on both sides, but for, for accuracy sake, um, the World Press Index, Armenia's uh, listed as 61st, I believe, Turkey uh, 154th, and Azerbaijan 161. So uh, for accuracy's sake, uh, I'll, I mean, I think Armenia is providing the most realistic numbers. As of right now, the casualty count on the Armenian side is over 375. On the Azeri side, it's uh, 4,400. And this may seem like a remarkable number, but when it comes to war and strategy, the side that's defending, the side that has the positions, um, oftentimes counterattacking is a side that has the least amount of casualties. Mm. So, and lastly, I guess uh, another question that might arise is where is the fighting happening? A lot of the fighting is happening on the outskirts, the peripheries of the Republic of Artsakh. We're seeing it in the northern regions in Upper Shahumyan. We're seeing it in the eastern regions of Talish and Matagis. And then we're also seeing it in the southeastern area uh, near the border of Iran uh, in the areas of Fizuli and Jebrail, which is uh, slightly... Um, it's not as mountainous, it's flatlands. That's where we're seeing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the casualties. Uh, it's a quote unquote meat grinder, uh, flatland. So um, hopefully that answers the question in a concise and cogent manner. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, that was very good. It, it's, it's a lot and I think we'll, you know, sort through it through the rest of this call. But before we get to that, I wanna push you a bit. I'd like to think that the Philos Project uh, prides itself on, on fairness, on trying to look at things as dispassionately as possible, even if we end up, you know, taking a strong uh, position on one side of, of a conflict or another. But in this case, do you, could you give me or give us 
the best argument from the Azeri side as to what's happening, right? What I've heard from you and from other Armenians and some independent sources is that Azerbaijan started this, they're encroaching, they're the aggressor, Turkey is helping them. Uh, this is happening because of domestic political concerns in these different countries, uh, and Armenia is the victim. What is the other side of that coin, just for the sake of argument? Wow, um, <laughs> that's actually a fantastic question. Um, I believe the Azeri argument is twofold. Uh, firstly, I think um, looking at this within the framework of territorial integrity. So uh, in international law, there's, there's these two kind of ideas being pitted against each other constantly. The idea of territorial integrity that, you know, states borders are sacrosanct, uh, liberation and secession movements, quote unquote, are not to be, uh, you know, tolerated or encouraged. And then there's the other side of self-determination, which is essentially an, an outgrowth of, of democracy and democratic values. So why should, so if a country is truly championing democracy, right, then they should, a certain group of people should have the rule, uh, the, the ability to, to rule themselves and to decide how they want to be ruled. And, um, you know, championing these, these values such as like popular sovereignty, you know? So when it comes down uh, and you boil it down, the common denominator is, you know, democratic values being pitted against kind of uh, more autocratic, I guess, um, uh, ideals. So for Azerbaijan, it's also important to look at this within the territorial integrity of, of the concept of pan-Turkism. And I'm sure uh, pan-Turkism will be spoken about. It's just uh, the idea, you know, of a united Turkic confederation ranging from, you know, Adrianople, which is modern day Edirne in, in the West, um, it's borders Bulgaria, all the way to Central Asia, which is where the, the quote unquote Turkic people originated. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the only kind of land, the small sliver of land uh, called Armenia is the only thing that's separating, mm -hmm. you know, Turkey from Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan uh, I, through the Caspian to Turkmenistan uh, from kind of realizing that goal. Um, secondly, I'd like to say, um, Azerbaijan likes to contend that, you know, Armenians are the aggressors. Armenians are firing upon these, these Azeri villages and, and kind of, you know, just acting sheerly out of aggression. My response to that, however, would be, why would Armenia do that? You know, um, Armenia, why would it fire on its villages? For Armenia, the status quo is beneficial. Armenia wants to maintain the status quo. You're looking at Turkey and Azerbaijan who have, you know, Turkey is the largest and strongest military in the Middle East. They have a country of 80 million people. Azerbaijan on the other side uh, of Armenia have 10 million people. Armenia has 3 million people. Is that, if we're looking at this mathematically and statistically mm -hmm. alone, uh, Armenia, there's no aggression on the Armenian side. All the Armenians want, all the Armenian people of Artsakh want essentially is, is independence. They want the, the undeniable right to live freely and independently. Uh, they want, to not live under sniper fire and artillery fire constantly. So for Armenians, essentially the, uh, the victory is recognition. Mm -hmm. Azerbaijan's end goal, I'm not sure because the way Azerbaijan is treating their territories, it doesn't seem like they really want their territories nor do they want the people that come with those territories. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it's good because you, you segued us into the, the question of context here and, and you started giving us some of the, the ge geographical context and for us, the philos also, this is a big, this is a big factor thinking about where, you know, any given conflict fits geographically, historically, and I, and I would like to turn to the historical context at this point and, and turn to uh, Professor Movsesian. It's always important to study the historical conflict or context of any conflict before one weighs in with an opinion. Could you give us a basic overview of the Armenian people uh, for a layperson in relation to this territory that Vaughn is talking about called Artsakh? What is Artsakh? Is it the same thing as Armenia? And why does it matter so much to Armenians? Yeah. Sure. Well, first of all, Robert, thank you very much for having me. I, wa I want to join Vaughn in, in saying that. Um, Artsakh, or Nagorno-Karabakh is often the, the, word, the term that's used in the West. This is a region in the Caucasus Mountains. It's about the size of Delaware. It's not part of the Republic of Armenia uh, right now. Even Armenia doesn't recognize it as such. But 
Um, its identity has been Armenian for millennia, by which I mean there's been a continuous Armenian majority in this region for thousands of years, and it's always been integral to the Armenian national identity, and I would say actually the Armenian Christian identity, because I know that's important to the Philos project. Uh, Saint Mestre of Mashtots, who invented the Armenian alphabet in the, in the fifth century, the first school, the first Armenian language school was in Artsakh in the uh, Amaras Monastery, which was founded by Saint Gregory the Illuminator, who is the, the converter of Armenia. Uh, and that monastery is still there in, in Karabakh. Uh, there are many others, including Gantasar, which is a very important medieval monastery, which is still in, in the region. Uh, it was, Artsakh was one of the original provinces of the Kingdom of Armenia, so it goes back a long way. Now, it's in the middle of the Caucasus, which means, you know, many different conquering peoples have come through, and, you know, for a while it was Mongol, it, there are Turkic peoples came, Kurdish peoples, but the Christian identity of that region never changed over all these uh, millennia. And because of that, because of this long Christian association uh, for Armenians, Artsakh is really very important to Armenia historically. Now, it was part of the Persian Empire for quite a long time, up until the 19th century, when it was taken over by the Russian Empire. Now, to understand what's happening right now, I want to go back a little bit further than, than Vaughn, who was talking about the 90s. You have to go back, I really think, 100 years to really kind of understand what's going on here, um, to the collapse of the Russian and the Ottoman empires at the end of World War I. So Armenians lived on both sides of the border, both the Ottoman side and the Russian side, and so they found themselves in the crosshairs. And um, during World War I, fearful that the Armenians would rise up and join the Russians, the, um, the Ottoman Empire engaged in an ethnic cleansing campaign against Armenians, which destroyed the, the Christian Armenian population of what is today Turkey, eliminated it basically, it could be a million, million and a half Armenians and other Christians died. And there was, although it was not entirely because of this uh, by any means, there was definitely a religious component to that. And if you read a really good book by two Israeli historians, it was published last year called The 30-Year Genocide by Benny Morris and Dror Zvi. It comes from Harvard University Press. They explained this. There was an unmistakable religious element to this. So that was in Turkey, and then the Ottoman army began to advance across the border into the Caucasus. And uh, for sure, the genocide would have continued on the other side of the, uh, of the border, except for an event called the Battle of Sardarabad, in which a very hastily organized Armenian force was able to stop the, Ar the Turkish army, the Ottoman Turkish army. This is today near the city of Yerevan, which is the capital of Armenia. Um, this is not a battle that's known in the West. I think nobody knows about it, actually, but it was extremely important for Armenian self-identity. The, the idea of a small group of Christian Armenians fighting to stop a Muslim Turkish army bent on their annihilation, this is a very important part of the Armenian identity. In fact, it goes back to an even earlier battle against the Zoroastrian Persians in the fifth century, the Battle of Avarar, in which, again, Armenia stood alone battling for its Christian identity. Now, how does this relate to today? So the Azeris in the Caucasus saw the advancing Ottoman army as liberators because they were gonna help liberate the, the Azeris from Russia. In fact, historians will tell you this is where the Azeri national identity begins. It begins but before this point, before the 20th century, the ethnic population was not called Azeri. They were called Tatars or even Caucasian Tatars. Uh, they identified with Turkey ethnically and linguistically but they're Shia Muslims, they're not Sunni Muslims, as, as the Turks are. So there was a brutal war between the Armenians and the Azeris 100 years ago with a lot of bloodshed on both sides, including in the capital city of Baku. So when the Ottoman army actually conquered Baku in 1918, there was a massacre of like 9,000 Armenians in the city. Um, that same year, the Azeris razed the city of Shushi uh, to the ground, and this is where uh, you may have seen the pictures of the Holy Savior Church being destroyed in the, or being attacked in the last couple of days. That's where it is. That's where the, it's in the city of Shushi. So you could say what was going on was kind of a side theater of the genocide. And I want to make plain, you're saying be fair. I, I, I don't think Armenians accused the Azeris of the genocide. It was, that was an Ottoman Turkish thing. But, but this was kind of a side theater or 
Or you might say the way uh, Thomas DeWall really has also excellent books on this, another scholar, it was sort of two theaters of conflict coming together, right? The Ottoman side and the Azeri side. And the Armenians remember this. They remember the Armenians fighting on the side of the Ottomans at the time. So when the war ended, um, the Soviet Union quickly ended any border dispute with Turkey. It gave up some historic Armenian lands around the city of Kars and then took over the Caucasus and divided it up among various ethnic groups. The Soviets initially promised Karabakh, which at the time was 90% Armenian. Uh, they promised it to the new Soviet Republic of Armenia. But then um, the, the history is that Stalin changed his mind and instead, uh, he was the commissar of nationalities at the time. Lenin was in charge, but commissar was the, the, the Stalin was the commissar of nationalities. He decided to place Karabakh in Azerbaijan, the new Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, as a divide and conquer strategy. Uh, and also because Azerbaijan then as now has significant oil reserves, which were very important for the Soviet Union. Um, that decision was never accepted by the Armenian population, but the Soviet Union kind of tamped things down for 70 years. Then as the Soviet Union started to break up um, uh, in 1988, there was a referendum in Karabakh, which voted to leave Azerbaijan and join Armenia. This led to um, uh, pogroms, I think you'd call them, against the Armenian citizens of Azerbaijan in Sumgayit and in Baku. And then it led to the terribly bloody war, which Vaughn already has spoken about. So that's kind of the context I think it, it brings you up to today. Very That's briefly, you know, when, you, when you talk about Armenian history, you're talking about thousands of years of history. So that's a, right. very, a very brief uh, summary. It, but it's very good and extremely helpful. Um, it's funny, the, the, the battle you mentioned, uh, Sar, say it again, Sar Dar Dar I, I've never heard of that. So there you go. That's, there, there's the problem right there. So now, I wanted to, you mentioned religion a few times in that, in that um, exegesis. And it reminds me of this great article that you just wrote for First Things, one that we sent out with uh, the invite for this briefing, and in which you frame this conflict, among other ways, not only as Armenian Azeri or Armenian Turk, but as Christian Muslim. Now, as you know, many people, not least of all, many people who make policy, U.S. policy on these questions would absolutely resist that sort of framing, uh, finding it repugnant in every sense of the word. So I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that and how you think the religious dynamic plays into this and, and maybe also where it doesn't play into this. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is hard to think about it in those terms. Um, you know, I, I said in that article, there are two kinds of analysts of the Mideast. Uh, there are those who say religion explains everything. And then there are those who say religion explains nothing. And I think they're both wrong. I think that actually religion doesn't explain everything, but you also can't simply dismiss it and say that it's not an important factor. And I would say in this conflict, religion is an important element, although not the only element, of course, and, and it's a complicated thing. So just as it was 100 years ago, this is obviously a fight between um, Muslim groups and Christian groups who, who definitely understand themselves that way. Uh, that's part of the book I told you about, the Harvard University Press book. I mean, the, the genocide clearly had religious implications. It wasn't just Armenians who were being killed. It was Assyrians also. It was Greeks also. This was, this was part of it. Um, now today, um, you know, Turkey is exporting Syrian Islamists to fight in Azerbaijan against, against Armenia. It's hard to avoid seeing that as, in some sense, a religious thing. Um, and they've been telling these fighters, I've seen on the internet, the videos that, you know, you're going to defend the faith against the infidel. So I, I think that's a, a religious element. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, two days ago or yesterday, um, the Azeris shelled the cathedral in Shushi, the Armenian cathedral in Shushi. That has no military importance, whatever, and it's quite far from the line of contact. So I don't see how else you can understand it except the signal that, you know, your kind is not wanted here. So, uh, I mean, now it's not entirely Christian Muslim, of course, and I think your guests will get to this later. I mean, so everyone thinks, okay, it's Christian Muslim, the Russians will help. Uh, the Russians are neutral. The Russians sell arms to both sides. And by the way, there's a bit of a divide there too. Armenians and Russians are all quote unquote Orthodox Christians, but the churches are not in communion. 
the Russian Orthodox Church is an Eastern Orthodox Church associated with, um, with Byzantium, with Constantinople. The Armenian Church is an Oriental Orthodox Church, which is linked to the Copts and the Syrians. And, and so these are not exactly, they're not in communion. So, uh, but anyway, so, the, but Russians are Christians, Armenians are Christians. It, it's important to a point, but, but the Russians have stayed neutral. Also there's Iran. You know, now I mentioned another part of Armenian identity is the fight for Christianity against Iran in the fifth century. That was a long time ago. Since then, things have been better. Uh, and uh, Armenia has a reasonably good relationship with Iran, notwithstanding the absence of religious ties. Um, so, but Iran is also staying neutral here. Iran is also staying out. And, and I should say, I think your other guests will get into this later, but you know, um, Americans might, uh, Americans shouldn't be too quick to judge Armenia in this respect. Our, the Caucasus is a bad neighborhood and you've got to find allies where you can. And the border with the Islamic Republic of Iran is really the only stable open border that Armenia has. So anyway, the short of it is, I think that the evidence shows there's definitely a religious component here, although not, not the only thing, obviously. Very good. Uh, Armin, you've been very patient. Um, you are something of a, uh, at least in my mind, you're something of a, an expert on Eurasian geopolitics. I know some of the things that you've studied and worked on before. But I'd like to maybe talk about some of that here for the next few minutes, uh, starting with, with Turkey. Turkey's come up both uh, in Vaughn's remarks as well as uh, Professor Movsesian's. Turkey's playing some role here, and it seems to be an important role. So could you talk to us again for, for lay people uh, about Turkish politics these days? What is the president Erdogan doing? Why is he doing it? And where does this current clash fit within his larger strategy? Sure, and uh, let me join everyone in, in thanking you, Robert, and thanking Philos Project and the Iraqi Christian Relief Society um, for having us. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be with everyone. and I. Also, I have to say, I truly appreciate uh, you taking the historical context into account, because more often than not, everyone is just talking about what's happening today, uh, which is the faulty way to go. So I appreciate that as an avid student of history myself. Um, and if I have to explain Erdogan's politics today, I can't but ignore uh, the history of Turkey itself, um, especially when it comes to um, the Armenian genocide that we already pretty uh, thoroughly discussed. But one crucial aspect that we haven't really touched upon is the fact that Turkey to this very day has not paid for its crimes of the genocide, not only against the Armenians, but against the Greeks, Assyrians, and other indigenous Christian minorities. And so it has, at, at its core of national identity, uh, for, uh, cemented by Ataturk, um, the idea of impunity and getting away with the crimes that they've perpetrated and, and profiting off the insurance, the properties, the stolen, uh, pillaged, uh, you know, gold and money uh, from everyone, including the Armenians in this case. And so um, when we're observing um, policies within the Turkish society of repression, of freedom of speech, of freedom of expression, of education policy, I mean, all of these to some extent find their roots in the cover-up of the Armenian genocide. I mean, you have to recognize that 80 million people uh, have uh, in Turkey, ma the majority of them would blank in your face, deny that the Armenian genocide ever happened. You know, I mean, this speaks of a totalitarian education system where children are brainwashed for generations since the times of Ataturk. Um, and so that's what we've been combating as a community. Um, every, when, whenever people ask us, well, why do you care about the Armenian genocide? Well, this is one of the most crucial parts. And I always run the parallel with Germany. I know it's not always fair to bring it to the Nazis, but um, I mean, where, where the German society not to face the consequences of the Holocaust and really rehabilitate as a society and kind, kind of come out of it over the decades, if you speak, maybe still are. Um, it wouldn't be the same Germany, the same reliable ally that we have in Europe. And the same argument can go for Turkey in this case as well. So a lot of the maladies that we find in Turkey, at least in my um, mind, uh, there's no doubt that a lot of it finds its roots in, in this. Um, the same thing with the repression of Kurds, the same thing with everything else. So now moving beyond that, of course, uh, coming to Erdogan's uh, politics lately. I mean, he, he was first kind of welcomed 
with uh, cautious optimism by the West when he came to power in 2002 uh, through his Justice and uh, Development Party, AKP. But very quickly, he kind of turned on the West, uh, kind of came down to what's known in Turkey as the uh, Sever Syndrome, uh, coming from the Treaty of Sever, when they believe in the elite that everyone is out there to get Turkey and everyone is out there to kind of dig a hole under them and whatnot. And so over the years, he's, he's, he's become increasingly totalitarian, uh, dictatorial in his policies. And Van uh, mentioned uh, some, of this, uh, some of this as well uh, in terms of uh, Turkey being one of the worst abusers of freedom of speech and journalistic thought um, in the world. It actually jails more journalists than any other country in the world, including China and North Korea. So it gives you a sense of how much repression there is in this country and how much the government is trying to exert control to, to run the narrative uh, in the society. Um, and Erdogan, uh, in the past few years especially, has been trying to position himself as the leader um, of the Sunni world, of the Sunni Muslim world. Hence, some of the conflicts we're now observing with Saudi Arabia and some other countries that they're kind of butting heads. Hence, um, Erdogan's uh, very pronounced anti-Semitism and anti-Israel positionings in the, in the past several years especially. Um, and hence, uh, Erdogan's support for um, unconditional support, may I add, to Azerbaijan in its current fight against Armenia. I know this was a long-winded way of coming uh, to this uh, situation, but I, I wanted to provide with a bit more of context. Um, Turkey and Azerbaijan proclaim each other one nation, two states. Uh, so they essentially see each other as one people. Uh, never mind that Azeris are ethnically more Iranian mix, and they didn't really come about until 1918, as Professor Mofsesian so uh, uh, clearly pointed out, but nevertheless, that's that's they are Turkified enough to see um, Turkey as their brotherly nation, and it's proclaimed on the highest levels of government by by their both presidents. Um, and so Erdogan has been trying to basically foment his own positioning. Um, he's been very much engaged in Libya. He's been very much, of course, engaged in Syria, uh, trying to um, stop. Kurds from uh, establishing any form of autonomy or resemblance of statehood in its Syrian northern border, which of course borders um, uh, to the south of Turkey and where there's a large uh, Kurdish population and right, they're trying to stop that. And in that whole process, they've of course been very openly cooperating with ISIS. I mean, all the revenue for ISIS, the majority of it has come through Turkey um, via oil transfers um, through Turkey. And everyone has been very much aware of this, uh, their cooperation with uh, Islamist terrorists, fundamentalist terrorists um, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in most and in most cases, they go counter to the US strategy and policy in these areas um, in, in order to establish themselves in the Sunni world, basically, that look, Erdogan is the guy, he's like sticking it up to the West, to the US, and despite the fact that it's a supposed not NATO ally and all the, you know, all the rest. Um, they are, they're definitely in the past four or five years at the very least gone completely 180 um, on the West, on the European Union, just basically holding everyone hostage uh, to a number of issues. I mean, there's just a litany of these. Uh, there's Greece, there's Cyprus, there's Armenia. There, there are just so many of these things. But um, I just tried to maybe give a little bit of flavor of what's going on. It's true. It's it's interesting. You know, for us at Philos, we have certain focus issues, focus countries, and it's it's amazing that the same actor pops up on almost every stage, right? In some sense, right? It's Syria. It's it's in Armenia. It's in Libya. It's 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 incredible. Um, however, I want to do with you something that I did with Vaughn there at the outset, which is to, to push you a bit, and uh, I'll do that mainly because I have friends, people I deeply respect who, who are pushing me and they're saying, I get it, you, you care about Armenia, but things are not that simple. First of all, Turkey, yes, it has some warts, but Turkey still is technically a NATO ally and it's better to have them close to us than to drive them even further into, you know, insanity. They also will say that uh, Armenia is very close to Russia and very close to Iran, certainly no friends of the US. They talk about Armenians even fighting with Russia in the Ukraine doing, you know, naughty things that, that they shouldn't be doing. And um, obviously, 
those those objections are are problematic from an American standpoint. And and you know, getting now toward kind of where the U.S. stands or where it should stand on all of this, how would you respond to to those counterpoints? Sure, and 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 there's quite a few of them. So I'll try to go through as much as I can. Um, first of all, I would invite everyone just to take a quick glance at the regional map. As was already described, Caucasus is a whole mess, basically. Um, and if you very carefully look at Armenia and Artsakh, you'll see that over 80% of the borders of uh, at least the Republic of Armenia are currently under illegal economic blockade by Turkey and Azerbaijan. So a landlocked country with 80% of its borders uh, blockaded and with both countries uh, not shying away from proclaiming that they want Armenia wiped off the face of this earth. So it doesn't already leave you with a lot of options as it is. So what does it leave you with? It leaves you with Iran to the south, which happens to be there, and it leaves you with Georgia and Russia, the bigger neighbor to the north. Um, so uh, Armenia already from the offset has very limited strategic maneuver space, let's just put it that way. And again, I mean, if I can bring it back to the Armenian genocide and, and um, justice for it, you know, had Turkey rehabilitated itself and had actually good neighborly relations with Armenia um, and Artsakh, we probably would have had a completely different geopolitical picture in the region. So we're kind of looking at the chicken or the egg issue, you know, uh, blaming the victim for trying to fight for its survival, I don't think is the, necessarily the right way to go um, here. At the same time, Armenia, since 2018, um, had the peaceful velvet revolution in the country, really further establishing itself as a vibrant democracy in the region. And when you are comparing that, especially with the uh, uh, lack of democracy or you know establishment of a dictatorial rule in Turkey, um, a complete 180 for the past 20 years. Iran, of course, uh, with the theocracy that it has. Um, Azerbaijan, one of the worst um, democracy indexes in the world. I mean, Armenia kind of stands out as this beacon of freedom um, and a nation that has the worldwide diaspora, including in many of the Western countries. So Armenia, I think in the Armenian identity, uh, the people see themselves as part of the Western civilization. Um, I call Armenia and Artsakh the easternmost Western country. Um, it's kind of the bastion of Western civilization. Um, and it's really longing for the West to embrace and to come to its uh, rescue in, in a way, you know? I mean, the only country that so far has been willing to do it is Russia and they have their own geopolitical interest. And of course there is the um, the inertia of uh, Russian empire and the Soviet empire, Armenia being kind of part of that whole thing. So we kind of need to look at this in more of a holistic manner. Um, Armenia has been very much cooperating with NATO. Um, Armenia has peacekeeping operations and troops stationed in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, in Mali, in Kosovo. Um, again, it's a, it's, it's a democracy and um, it's been uh, trying to uh, cement better relations with the European Union. It uh, recently signed a deep and comprehensive association agreement uh, that is in the process of getting ratified in all 28 member states of the European Union. So what I'm trying to say is it's an unfair um, blame game on Armenia. Um, it has very limited options and it's trying to do the best it can. It's cooperating with the sanctions regime in, on Iran, despite the fact that it's one of only two lifelines supporting Armenia these days. Um, and it's keeping Russia at a certain bay as well, because it, it's, it's not in Russia's interest to have Armenia as a democracy. And they have been trying to sabotage that to some extent as well as a government, because they are afraid that this could become an example for uh, Russian citizens who were very actively following the event in Yerevan in 2018 and throughout Armenia, that that could become a threat to uh, Putin's own rule. Uh, and we're seeing the same things happening in Belarus, for example, right now. I mean, it, it's, this is contagious. People get excited, especially in societies where they are, they've been repressed for many, many years. And so I would invite everyone to study the history and geopolitics a bit closer and to really embrace Armenia for uh, the country that it is. It's very interesting. And I heard everyone on the call to uh, submit their questions. There's a box there at the bottom. You can uh, enter the question. And if we have time, I'll get to it. We have one question from uh, Alexander. 
but before we get to that, I, Armin, I want to ask you one more question about Israel. Now, the Philos Project, we work a lot on Israel. We lead groups there. We work on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I've always thought in a very loose way, don't, don't ask me to you know, sort of defend it point for point, but I always have thought about Armenia in some sense as a Christian Israel, right? It's a, it's a very ancient people in an ancient land, right? They're trying to survive. A lot of people in the neighborhood don't really want them there. Uh, and, and what you said about the kind of the easternmost Western country, there, there's something similar about that too. And yet, doesn't exactly work so well. In fact, Armenia recently accused Israel of arming Azerbaijan, and Israel does in fact have close ties to Azerbaijan as it's one of their largest oil sources. And then uh, on the other side, you hear rumors of Iran facilitating Russian arms into Armenia. And you know one can't help but ask, what is the role of Israel? What is the role of Iran? Is there a chance that this becomes or maybe already has become in some way some kind of proxy war between the two countries or even between the West and Iran. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts in that regard, but uh, I'm definitely interested in the dilemma between two countries that on paper seem to be, be a perfect match, but geopolitically find themselves, uh, if not on opposite sides, certainly not aligned as much as one might think. Sure. I mean, that's a very um, important question for Armenians worldwide, actually, um, because there have been news and reports publicly for years now that uh, Azerbaijan has, uh, has been purchasing billions of dollars worth of armaments from Israel. Um, and these uh, concerns have been um, conveyed to the Israeli side from, from Armenia, uh, from the Armenian government. And it was always told that, oh, we're doing this for um, Azerbaijan's own defense purposes. It's not going to be utilized for offensive purposes. And yet we are now seeing um, where Israeli made high um, precision drones, suicide drones, um, other technology is being utilized against the civilian, civilian populations. Um, Armenia actually had just opened up an embassy in Tel Aviv uh, just about a month ago. And after two weeks, they ended up recalling the ambassador in a sign of protest to this. And we're getting some reports that um, Israel is um, questioning uh, the relationship with, with Azerbaijan, at least as when it comes to um, arms sales, because at the end of the day, those are being utilized not for precisely military purposes, but to terrorize the civilian populations in Artsakh and Armenia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I choose to believe that, you know, this will uh, become more, and this has become evident and, and they are taking note of it. Um, and uh, I don't know, um, so let's just hope for the best. I mean, uh, we, we at the ANCA are working very hard, both with Jewish American organizations here um, to also kind of convey that because the communities worldwide in the diaspora are extremely close. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand Israel's strategic prerogative of maybe developing relations with Azerbaijan as kind of an example of a uh, Jewish Muslim uh, kind of relationship, at least on the state level. But now with the recent uh, positive developments with the Abraham Accords of uh, UAE and other countries, uh, uh, you know, opening up relations uh, more with Israel, I think the strategic significance of Azerbaijan for Israel will further de deteriorate and go down. And I think they'll really um, stand up for the values um, that Israel, uh, you know, professes, and that is democracy, freedom, liberty, um, exactly things that Azerbaijan is uh, against. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, I want to get to a couple of these questions. I'm going to combine several here, uh, all of which have to do with um, resolution. So Nina, Nina Shea, a friend of I think most of us, uh, asks, what are prospects for peace talks organized by the West? What would be the optimal solution to end the aggression? I'm going to go uh, up to... Um, Alexander's question. Um, this is being asked in his personal, not his professional capacity. Uh, if Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan are engaging in these skirmishes to prop up their domestic political base through the economic problems, COVID fallout, why and how could US or Russian mediation uh, be helpful? Those are sort of the same question. Habib Malik, uh, another good friend, asks about 
the proposed pipeline that is being talked about between Turkey and Azerbaijan, between the Caspian and the Mediterranean, how much of a factor is that? So pointing toward the, uh, the involvement of great powers and some of these geopolitical factors as it relates to a re revolution or resolution uh, of this conflict. I'll, I'll leave that open for, for anyone who wants to chime in. I mean, I can try maybe. Um, sure, go for it. There, there were quite a few questions there. Um, regarding the Western um, backed negotiations, right? There was one, one about that. Yeah. Um, so number one thing that the West, I think should do right now um, with the leadership of the US is just to have Turkey back off from this conflict. Because uh, when Van was talking to the first question of what's new in this conflict, the newest element of the conflict is that Turkey has been directly involved in this conflict, uh, sending uh, not only mercenary terrorists from Syria to fight on the Azeri side, but also deploying F-16 fighter jets, as well as military advisors to basically take control of the command of this whole operation. So first and foremost, we need Turkey to back off because um, as a member of the NATO, uh, they have certain obligations. Um, if you're a candidate country, you have to meet certain obligations. It seems like they, those are not really upheld once you're a member and you uh, digress from the position that you were in. So first and foremost, we need the US to really send a strong signal to Turkey that it needs to back off because we have not seen any positive developments anywhere from Cyprus since the occupation of Turkey to Libya that Turkey has played any constructive role and definitely won't play that in this case. Um, and then beyond that, I think the, we, we just need the policymakers to understand the historical context um, a little better to be able to address some of these issues because otherwise it's at loggerheads. It's as Vaughn said, territorial integrity versus people's inalienable right to secession, to self-determination. I actually call it remedial secession because if Artsakh were not to secede, it would have been subjected to yet another genocide. I'll maybe keep at that. I don't mean to take over the whole um, conversation. Vaughn or Professor Movsesian, any, there were a couple of questions in there. Any answers on that? Um, I would like to ask, it's not one of the questions, but uh, Professor Movsesian, because you know we talked about religion and we are a Christian organization, our mission is promoting positive Christian engagement in the Middle East. So the, the Christian dimension of this is obviously important for us as philos, but also I think for all of us Christians living here in the West. How would you uh, answer the question about the relevance of this topic and specifically for Western Christians? How should we think about it? Are there specific ways that we as Christians can engage uh, and, and try to assist in some way? Yeah, um, well, thank you. Um, you know, honestly, I don't see how Christians wherever they are, wouldn't think this is relevant to them. I'll refer you to um, an, a Providence Magazine article by Alberto Fernandez just this week, who's a Western Christian, writes about why Artsakh is important. It's a really fine article. Uh, you know, the Bible says, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. And so I think, you know, Christians should care about other Christians. That doesn't mean that they should only care about other Christians or shouldn't try to help other people. Of course, Christians should do that, but, but surely they should care about other Christians. And this is an ancient Christian civilization that as somebody said on the internet came this close to being annihilated a hundred years ago uh, and is fighting for its existence now. You know, and, and I should say, uh, I wanna just follow up on something Armin was talking about. The fact that Turkey is directly involved in this fighting fills Armenians with a particular dread because as Armen said, Turkey continues to deny the genocide. And President Erdogan spoke recently of fulfilling the mission our grandfathers have carried out for centuries in the Caucasus. So, you know, uh, Armenians have every reason to think that if they give, uh, if they surrender control of Karabakh, then the genocide of Christian Armenians will just continue. Um, and, uh, you know, other Mideast Christians I know are suffering the same. And I know Philos does a lot of good work in that regard. So, you know, it's a sad thing about Mideast Christians sometimes. There's a, there's a joke about this, that in America, Mideast Christians are too Mideast for the right and too Christian for the left. And so nobody really cares about them. And that's really- It's very accurate. 
And that's, that's really a tragedy. And, and I would hope that Christians in the West do see solidarity with, with other Christians elsewhere. Now, what can they do? Of course, Christians can always pray, but, but not only that, um, you can write Congress, you can write your representatives and insist that they get involved and promote a peaceful settlement. And this doesn't mean, by the way, sending American troops on the ground. No one is asking for that. But you know, America can use its political clout to try to push for a peaceful settlement to this to this problem. And I think that Armenian, excuse me, uh, Christians can do that. They can donate to relief in Armenia. Armenia Fund is collecting money to help civilians who've been injured by this fight in Artsakh, and they can do that too. I'm going to turn that question uh, over to you, Armin, and you, Vaughn, as well. And I want to leave uh, Juliana Tamarazi uh, of the Rocky Christian Relief Council a couple of minutes at the end, just to. Uh, say a few words, but for both of you, action steps, what should we do? The big question. Um, I guess I'll uh, take a stab at it before Armin goes more, uh, I guess, comprehensively into it. But I think there's a lot of things we could do uh, from a grassroots level. Uh, you know, we could lobby and, and try to push our, our elected officials to, you know, uh, be responsive to their constituents. And and you know, pressure them to to sanction Turkey and kind of uh, going back to what Armen was mentioning, Turkey's got to back off from this conflict. And one of the ways in doing that is to to sanction Turkey, and we could do that by you know writing to our Congress members, writing to our senators. Um, I think on an individual level, spreading awareness and 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 amplifying the Armenian perspective and the Armenian voice uh, from what's going on. We're seeing as Armen also mentioned. Uh, Facebook cracked down on 9,000, I believe, Azeri bots that have been, there's been ties and links with the Azeri administration. Um, I also think that we need to divest money from Turkey. Uh, we need to divest funds from Azerbaijan as well. And I think those are two ways in which would help not only uh, prevent their aggressive actions, but also kind of uh, deter them from, from trying to instigate in conflicts that they're not really a part of. I mean, a lot of it has already been mentioned. Um, so I actually, before I do that, I want to address this whole Ukraine uh, question. It's first time I'm hearing that Armenians are fighting with Russians in Ukraine. So if there's any credible sources of that information, I'd, I'd want to actually see that myself. But to my knowledge, there is no Armenian involvement in the Ukraine crisis. We have no horse in, in that race, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then speaking uh, to what can be done, I think in addition to everything that was mentioned, I would also invite everyone listening to us to really do some of research and reading on their own. I mean, if you don't take us for the face value, then I, I invite everyone to do a little more digging. And some of the books that Professor Movsesian already recommended, I think there's a lot of content out there. And of course, at least I am as a resource as well, if anyone would want to reach out. I know there's a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, so I'd welcome the conversation and uh, dialogue to move forward. So uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me. My entire contact information is on our website at ancawr.org. And so are a lot of action alerts on our website of what people can do. You can simply visit the ANCA website, anca.org, and then you can uh, automatically message your elected officials. You can uh, contact the president. You can call your elected representatives. Everything is done to make the process very easy and smooth. So if people want to take that approach, then uh, a lot of it is already available on our website. That's right. And I'll give a personal plug for ANCA and, and the work that they do. We, we work very closely with them and we have over the years. They are uh, great partners and really, I think, sophisticated in um, uh, in making the case to the American people, uh, the American government, and also governments, uh, you know, around the world through their different subsidiary organizations. So definitely check out their website. There's, there's a lot of information there. I'd also uh, point you to something that Armin and some of his colleagues flagged for me that I had, again, never heard of, which is this incredible story of what Americans did with Armenians, uh, the help that they provided for Armenians um, about 100 years ago during the genocide through, through this organization called the Near East Relief. Uh, massive numbers of Armenian orphans were, were saved from, from that genocide and raised. And I've actually met now some number of the descendants of those people. A great example of the kinds of things America not only can do, but has done. And I think, at least for me, an inspiration as to what we should do going forward. Um, 
another organization that I deeply respect is the Iraqi Christian Relief Council. And I want to give Juliana Tamarazi uh, the last word here. She's been a partner on a number of these fights related to Christians of the Near East and Iraq and Lebanon and elsewhere. And she's been to Armenia. She's visited some of the Assyrian villages in Armenia. She herself is Assyrian, and I know cares very much about the country and its well-being. Juliana, do you want to chime in here maybe with a few uh, final words before we all go? Hopefully the technology cooperates here. Juliana? I'm sure it's some mute issue. <laughs> you would think that after how many months of COVID that we would all be Zoom ninjas, but that is absolutely not the case. And I'm speaking, first of all, about this guy right here. Um, Juliana, can you hear us? I'm sad. I would ask you to type <laughs> your remarks uh, in the box, but I'm not sure we have time. That's a shame. Can you hear? Oh, there she is. Yes. Welcome. Hi, I just uh, I just got the link. Can you guys okay. hear me? Okay. Yes, Hi. yes, indeed. My God, what a, what a panel. Thank you, everybody. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad. Thank you, Robert and Philos, for this partnership and panelists. It was great. And Robert, as you mentioned, I was in Armenia last October, as last uh, April. What a beautiful country! And you know, Assyrians and Armenians have been so close for so for millennia. And uh, it's incredible to see this happening to our south, to Armenia. And I had to break the silence and. What I noticed uh, happening to this issue was what uh, what happened. What was happening in 2003, 4, 5, to Iraq, to the Assyrians. American Americans weren't understanding what was happening uh, to the Iraqi Christians, to the Assyrians, and and uh, Robert and I spoke and we said we're going to have to put an educational program together to really help the Americans understand what's happening. And so therefore, here we are, and this is great. And, you know, speaking of, uh, from a Christian perspective, from a policy perspective, look, you guys, we, America has a lot of an immense economic power that needs to be leveraged in caucuses and elsewhere. And I think America needs to speak up. Um, from a Christian perspective, uh, we see that, we see what happened in Iraq. Um, the Iraqi Christians have emptied the country, they have left, the Syrian Christians have left, and those countries have come to the breeding ground for uh, radicalism, and we don't want Armenia, we don't want to lose that Christian land, and that is not good for American foreign policy. And I think uh, America needs to break the, break the silence. And you guys, I think it was Mark who, uh, maybe it was Armin who said, uh, really, we need to learn history. A lot of policymakers need to start learning the history to not to repeat the mistakes of the past. And when I saw the bombing of the cathedral yesterday, uh, I just, my heart broke because how many of our cathedrals were bombed in Iraq? That's a loss of heritage, world heritage, Christian heritage, and it needs to be stopped. We need to learn from the past to be able to not to repeat the mistakes uh, in the in the future. So uh, hopefully, and whoever is listening, whoever is watching this program, now you have learned this. We've unpacked this for you. This this distinguished panel has unpacked this issue for you. Now it is up to you to go and educate others, and really stand up and write to your to your state reps, as uh, Mark was saying, and hold the policy makers accountable. Uh, because we have to do something about this, otherwise it will continue. I'm a descendant of uh, a genocide survivor. My great grandmother and others were perished in my family in the great genocide, and uh, we can't have this repeated. And uh, Armenia is beautiful, you guys. I have to say, you all have to go and see Armenia, visit Armenia. It's beautiful, really. It's a beautiful country, and God bless you my Armenian fellow brothers. And we, uh, we want to lead a trip for Philos out there as soon as uh, all of this craziness upon craziness ends. That will we'll definitely keep everyone abreast of that. But thank you, Juliana. You are, all four of you are people I really respect and grateful for, for, for you guys taking the time today talking about this important issue. More to come from Philos. 
on the Armenia issue, but in the meantime, follow ANCA and uh, also our um, Jaffa Gate uh, web briefing put together by Vaughn, who studies the news every week and puts together uh, a summary of what's happening in, in the Armenian arena for, for our audience. Thanks again to everyone. I hope you have a great weekend. Please pray for the Armenian people. Don't forget about them and stay tuned uh, for more on this and lots of other things. Take care and God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.